All right, uh, as per Kelsey's request and for anybody else who may be curious as to how to do it themselves, uh, this is going to be my video on how to make uh, oven-baked macaroni and cheese. Uh, we're going to be making a cheese beche uh, bechamel sauce and then we're going to incorporate cheese into the sauce. And we're also going to be making uh, pancetta breadcrumbs to spread over the top of the macaroni and cheese for when we bake it in order to give it a really nice crunch. Now you want to get these going at about a medium setting on your uh, stove top. Usually I'd go to a little bit more effort to uh, put these in the pan nice and flat so they maintain that round shape, but I'm just going to be grinding them up anyway so it doesn't really matter a whole lot. In the meantime, you want to get your oven going, set it to preheat at the lowest possible temperature. Um, you could do this at a higher temperature and it would go faster in order to dry out your breadcrumbs, but to be 100% honest, they burn so easily and so quickly, it's easier to uh, take your time, set it as low as it'll go. Alright, the pancetta is more or less where I want it to be, so I'm going to pull it off the heat, turn the, the oven off, and then I'm going to pull all of it, you can see it's kind of smoking there, out of the pan and into a little bowl. Uh, be careful you don't burn yourself because this is going to be pretty hot. Alright, and set that aside. You want it to cool so that it'll dry. Because you really want it, when you blow it through your food processor, you really want it to make like a really fine, fine powder in those breadcrumbs. So then I'm going to bring it back, bring it back to the burner that I want. And I use this, this knife here. Add three tablespoons of butter to the unwashed pan that I used to do up the pancetta. Uh, the reason being here is that uh, I kind of want my macaroni and cheese to pick up some of that pancetta flavor right from the right from the word go. All right, now at a relatively low temperature, the butter and all I got all my fat into the pan. It's all completely melted. To that, I'm going to add. Because I use three tablespoons of butter, I'm going to add three tablespoons of flour just right into the butter. This is going to form what's called a roux, and that's what's going to be going to be what makes the mac and cheese nice and uh, creamy and delicious. This is your thickening agent. Otherwise, you'd just have milk and cheese, and that wouldn't that wouldn't be nice. That'd be all stringy and nasty. And then with a whisk, you really kind of want to get. The flour all incorporated into the butter so that everything's nice and moist, and all the little glutens in the flour get to, uh, you know, clump up and hydrate. That way, they're where we want them to be. Now, I like to do this at as low a temperature as you can get because I don't want my flour to brown too much. I kind of want to keep that sort of pure yellow color to my mac and cheese. But it, I mean, if you let it go too long and it starts to turn a little brown, it's not a huge deal. All right, now you want to add, I use half and half uh, for this, but a lot of people will just use straight milk. Uh, I prefer half and half. I think it gives the macaroni and cheese a little bit of a creamier texture, but that's just me personally. You could use whatever kind of milk you want, really. I used uh, heavy whipping cream at one point, but that came out a little dense. I personally would not recommend heavy whipping cream, but you know, give it a try yourself. See how it turns out. I mean, it's not like it was inedible, and it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't even that it didn't taste good. But you basically want to add milk until it starts to thicken up on you and then add a little bit more milk in order to thin it out until you get the texture that you want and I'll show you the texture that you want this is kind of an ongoing process so see how it's starting to thicken up and turn into like oatmeal almost obviously that's not what we want but that's just a sign that the the flour is starting to expand the flour is starting to uh, absorb all that liquid and fat and it's really going to turn into the sort of uh, I think it's called a bechamel sauce that we want and then this is going to be the base that we add all of our cheese and all of our flavoring agents to but uh, you can see that the the roux is thickening but it's also starting starting to uh, loosen up and the little clumpies are starting to cook out which is really what you want in order to get the flour flavor like that flour grittiness out of your out of your sauce, you really have to cook this for about 15 to 20 minutes uh, in order to get that nice smooth consistency that you want with the bechamel. All right, now you should be able to tell here. I don't know if you could see okay, but uh, you could tell that the uh, this is the consistency that you more or less want for your base sauce. Uh, this is the the bechamel. It's nice and thick, but you see it's it's uh, also creamy and it doesn't have a whole lot of, it doesn't have lumps and stuff in it this is really what you want that's why you want to use a whisk rather than a fork or a spoon in order to spin it because you really want to break all the little clumps up 
and make sure that you have a nice smooth consistency because that's what you're shooting for with mac and cheese. Um, and then to this we're going to add 8 ounces of pepper jack. Uh, if you don't like spicy you could always just do Monterey Jack but I like pepper jack I think it gives it a little bit of a kick. Uh, and then you want to turn the heat up just a little bit and get stirring so that this cheese starts to melt. Now you want to keep an eye on the cheese as it's melting because you don't want it to start forming strings like you would see on a pizza. You want to keep this nice sort of like smooth consistency. All right, and basically what we're doing here, the bechamel is kind of like a canvas and you get to paint whatever you want on the canvas in order to make it, in, the, in this case, in order to make it taste good. But I mean, it's experiment. I'm not exactly a chef, so try out different cheeses and see what happens. And that's half the fun of working in the, in, uh, in the kitchen at home, is that if you screw up, nobody knows. You just throw it away and order a pizza. All right, as you can probably tell here, I got my water going on. This is going to be what I boil my macaroni in for the macaroni and cheese. And you might also notice that my sauce here, because I put all that cheese in, is starting to get a little on the grainy side. If that starts to happen to you, just grab a little bit of uh, milk or uh, whatever that you're using. I'm all out of half and half, so I'm using just regular old skim milk here. Uh, plonk that down in your sauce and stir it in in order to kind of get rid of the graininess. Uh, you want to do this kind of early on if you start to see it start to, if you see it starting to go. Because one, if it breaks and you start seeing oil like pile up on top of your sauce, then forget it. You're, you're, uh, you're sunk. So you want to make sure that you keep this nice and uh, sort of hydrated while you're doing it. Uh, because otherwise the whole sauce will be ruined. Now that I have more or less the consistency that I want out of the Monterey Jack, in order for the nice color and a little bit of uh, flavor, I'm going to put in four ounces of uh, extra sharp cheddar. Uh, this comes in an 8 ounce block. I'm using half of it for this and the other half of we're going to shred up and use on uh, as a topper underneath our uh, breadcrumbs that we'll be making here in a bit. Alright, now hopefully you can see the kind of consistency that we're going for here. It's basically, what you, basically what you have here is kind of a cheese pudding. But uh, basically what you want is that when you stir it you should be able to see ribbons forming in the, in the sauce but it shouldn't be like sticking, like it should return to a nice flat uh, surface when you're done stirring. So this is pretty much done in terms of like texture and preparation. It's been cooking for, I don't know, about 20 minutes. So all the flour flavor should be cooked out. I'm going to put this down on low because I don't want it to burn. And in the meantime, we're going to do some flavoring because right now, while we do have the right texture and consistency, it would be really, really bland. So basically what I'm going to put in, and this is the point where you can put in basically whatever you like and experiment to your heart's content because that's sort of the fun bit, in my opinion, that's sort of the fun bit with cooking is, uh, you know, you get to screw around and then you get to eat whatever you, uh, whatever you come up with. What I like to put in, because I like mine to have a little bit of a zing, I put in a couple of squirts of sriracha that boosts sort of that yellowish color that we have going on there and it gives it a nice spicy tang. To that we're also going to add a couple of squirts of fancy mustard. My mustard's almost running out so i got to get to shook all the way down on the bottom there. A couple of squirts of fancy mustard. And you see I'm not really measuring any of this stuff. It's uh, like I said, it's really kind of like to your own taste and the tastes of the people that you're cooking for. And I mean remember, you're not cooking for the pulp. So if what you, if what you're uh, if what you're making, if the, I don't know, if it, if it doesn't turn out exactly the way you want it, but it's still good, that's all that really matters. I'm also going to add a couple of pinches of salt. Not too much salt to the sauce, because I'm also going to salt the water that we're doing. The, uh, geez, geez, there's a lot of smoke coming out of that island there. I'm also going to add some salt to the water that we're going to boil the noodles in. And uh, that'll add salty flavor to it without having to overload the sauce with a bunch of stuff. All right, I moved the water to the front burner. For whatever reason, there's some schmutz down in that back eyelet that was smoking and it was making me uncomfortable. So I'm going to clean that out after I'm done. To the sauce, I'm also going to add some fresh cracked black pepper. Uh, if you don't have a pepper grinder, I recommend that you get one. Um, I just find that the flavor coming out of the fresh cracked is better than the kind that you get in the shaker. All right, let's... Uh, Grab a spoon and we can have a taste here. Mm. 
All right, that's nice and creamy. You can see that uh, it coats the back of a spoon, and if you run your finger through it, it keeps its shape. That's pretty much the consistency that we want. It's actually a little bland. It could use a little more sriracha. And you know what this could use? Actually, give me one, just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and throw some mustard powder in there. I think that that will go a long way towards brightening it up and giving it a little bit of a non-sriracha zing, which I think will be really nice. Now, Tressa likes to shop at the Asian market all the time, so the, the mustard that I'm adding in is uh, Chinese hot mustard powder. Uh, if you can't find that, it's not its not a huge deal, it's not hugely important. Just use regular mustard powder if you could find it in the, uh, in the grocery store. If you can't find it in the grocery store, just use regular old yellow mustard like you would put on a hot dog. You know, Heinz yellow mustard. Keeps it, uh, keep it as simple as you can. Don't, don't think you have to bend over backwards in order to find exotic ingredients. It's macaroni and cheese. And like I said, you're not cooking for the pulp. So, you know, make it as easy as you want to make it. If you want to go out and track down some exotic ingredients, that's fine. But if you, if you can't be bothered and you just want to use regular old whatever, that's fine too. You don't even have to use mustard. You know, like I said, it's you add the flavors that you like and that the people that you're cooking for like. All right, our water's coming up to boil here. I'm gonna go ahead and throw a little bit more salt in there. Um, I find that the extra salt sort of makes all the other flavors sort of like stand up and sing, whereas without the salt, it doesn't do as much. Um, all right, that's starting to come to a boil, so I'm gonna get my macaroni ready and I like to add the pasta just before the water comes to a boil I don't know if that actually makes it any better I find that I get a lot less boil overs that way that might just be because I pay better attention to it I don't know but go ahead and dump your macaroni in and I'm just using regular old market brand uh, uh, macaroni elbows the little kind it's you could use whatever pasta you want but this is a little more traditional I think that people like it a little better Alright, my water is starting to come back up to a boil here after I added that whole box of uh, macaroni. And because you're going to be cooking this again, uh, we're going to put it in the oven and finish it off. Uh, I would recommend leaving your macaroni a little bit undercooked. That still needs to be in there for a little bit. Because it'll cook some more once it's in there and it'll absorb a lot of that like cheesy goodness. And make it taste much better, but if you put it in there fully cooked, what will happen is as it cooks in the oven it will turn to mush and you'll basically get like a macaroni and cheesy kind of like pudding and it's still good it's just not as good so I recommend leaving it a little just a little bit undercooked not necessarily crunchy but like al dente alright let me go ahead and try these macaronis again here see how we're doing no that's right where I want it so well, I'm tilt you over so you can see what I'm doing on this end So I got my behind the scenes action over here. I got my colander set up underneath my sink so that I can drain the macaroni without burning myself. You really want to be careful to keep your face away from the steam because it can burn you and it's not. It's un unpleasant. Alright, let me make sure I get all the little macaronis. I don't want to waste anything. Try not to burn myself. I'm going to go ahead and uh, sort of well, knock it down, knock it stuff down over here. Sort of like run some uh, cold water over the top because like I said, I don't want it to overcook. This isn't necessary, this isn't 100% necessary because I'm just going to plunk it right down in a warm pot and let it sit for a bit. But this, the starch that's kind of clinging to the macaroni is really, it acts like a thickening agent too. And I already have the sauce right to the consistency that I want it to be at, so I don't want it to get any thicker. Alright, now I'm just going to plonk the macaroni straight down in my cheese sauce. And I'm going to do it straight in the pan that I did the sauce in in order to save myself some uh, dishwashing duties later on. If you wanted to make it a little fancier, you could do it in like a little crock pot or 
you know, pretty much anything that you that you think would be a good idea. But uh, you might also it might also look like I put in way too much sauce, which is probably the case. But I like a lot of cheese in my mac and cheese, so I don't really mind. And then you want to take a rubber spatula and sort of like fold the macaroni into the cheese sauce as good as you can. Try to get it all nice and covered so that it's all incorporated. There we go. That's pretty well incorporated. And as of right now, I am just going to let it chill there for a bit so that the macaroni can absorb some of the cheese sauce and the cheese sauce itself can kind of rest a little bit. I don't know if that does any good, but I think it does. All right, now we're going to finish off our uh, pancetta breadcrumbs for the topper. Uh, basically, everything's nice and cool. Everything's a little crunchy. We're going to drop that straight into the food processor. Okay, snap the top on and just pulse it until it becomes like a mush. If you can see it's turning kind of like into bacon bits a little bit, that's kind of what you want. Uh, if you want to just skip this step entirely because you just can't be bothered or just because you don't have time, that's perfectly fine. The, the easy way to do this is just to buy unflavored store-bought breadcrumbs and bacon bits. I do it from scratch just because I like doing this kind of stuff from scratch. But you don't have to by any stretch of the imagination. Now I'm going to go ahead and toss in my toasted and cool bread here. I'm going to rip it up into chunks just to kind of help things along a little bit. I don't want my food processor to have to struggle too much. Um, if you don't have a food processor, you can do this in a blender. But uh, I recommend doing it one piece of bread at a time and not doing nearly this much all in one go. Because uh, it'll gum up the... It could gum up your blender pretty quick and then you have to go in there with a spoon in order to dig all the, all the, all the gunk out. Alright. Those are my two pieces of bread. I'm going to do two more. And the bread should soak up all that pancetta oil and whatnot. And this time around, I'm going to go ahead and add some black pepper. Let me go grab it. A little bit of salt. There we go. Now this is a step that you, a step that you could probably skip if you're only using them for uh, macaroni and cheese, but I like to stick the breadcrumbs on a cookie sheet and spread it out as thin as you can get it. As you can see, this is about as thin as this is going to go and uh, stick it in the oven on its lowest setting, which we'd already preheated to, uh, for about 20 to 30 minutes, but you don't want to leave the kitchen and go watch TV or whatever at this point because of uh, you want to keep an eye on this through the window in order to make sure that it doesn't start to burn because it burns really fast. All right, so the breadcrumbs are done, and everything is pretty much set. I've switched the oven from the, its lowest setting back to base 350, and uh, I have my macaroni and cheese, my breadcrumbs, and I've also shredded that last four ounces of cheddar uh, that I talked about earlier. Uh, you basically take that four ounces of cheddar and sprinkle it over the top of your, essentially what is a macaroni and cheese casserole right now. Alright. Make sure that that's nice and evenly distributed, because at the same time, you, you want it to be cheesy, but at the same time you don't want somebody to get like... A giant mouthful of straight cheese. You want them to get a nice even distribution of everything all in, in, in every bite. And then over top of that you want to give it a nice sort of even sprinkling of these breadcrumbs. And like I said you don't have to use these breadcrumbs. You could use uh, store-bought in order to save time. You can use you don't even have to use breadcrumbs if you really don't want to. I mean, it's not, it, it makes it taste a little better, but it's not inedible without it. Uh, one trick that I like to use if you're making uh, macaroni and cheese for like a party or for little kids or anything like that is if you buy uh, goldfish, like the little uh, cracker snack, the goldfish, 
uh, and blow them through your blender or your food processor until it's basically like a powder and then you could spread that over top that gives it a nice neat little flavor and it's a really bright sort of like neon orange it's, I'm trying not to spread this on too thick because we already have a bunch of that pancetta flavor in the sauce itself and I don't want it to taste like you know I don't want it to taste too much like pancetta there's a lot of other flavors going on here that I want to make sure also get uh, you know their time in the limelight as you're eating this but uh, you know it, you don't have to be as careful as I am I'm kind of anal about this kind of stuff so alright and then I would uh, I would stick this into the oven uncovered for about 20 minutes. Uh, everything in there is already cooked. So you basically just want to make sure that everything's incorporated, that all the flavors are nice and meshed together, and that the cheese on top has had a chance to melt and kind of like ooze its way down to the bottom. Okay, the timer just went off. Let's see how we did here. Oh, I'm gonna do this without banging into my tripod here. All right. Mm, that smells really good. And you see how the cheese is starting to come up around the edge, that's really what you want to see. Now just for purely cosmetic reasons, I'm going to stick this back in and set it to broil. And I'm going to leave it broil for about five minutes. I'm going to leave the thing open because I don't really want it to, I really don't want it to cook at 500 degrees. I just want to like brown the top. So I'm going to leave this go. Actually five minutes is probably a little much. I'm going to do it for three minutes. And uh, yeah, at three minutes we'll pull it out and see how it looks. Okay, three minutes was actually a little much. I pulled it out at two because I could tell that it was starting to smoke a little bit and I didn't want it to burn. Did you see how you've gotten that nice, like, sort of, like, brown char on the top now? That's not even really a char. It's just, like I said, like a browning. And, uh, well, there's the three-minute mark. And, uh, we're going to go ahead and pull it out. And, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's see how we did. Now I should probably let this sit for a bit so that it has a chance to congeal and all that but I can't wait so I'm going to go ahead and cut into it right now Let me go ahead and see if I can't get a nice sort of uniform scoop coming out of there yeah I think we did okay but let me keep it off of the blooper reel Yeah, here's what it looks like. You see how the the breadcrumbs have formed a nice little crunchy top on the on there, and that'll give it a nice little crunch. That way, it doesn't taste like cheese pudding. And let's get an actual proper bite here. Hmm. It's got a nice little bit of spice, a little bit of mustard, a lot of cheese. Excellent. Now, you don't have to put spicy in it. If you're not a big fan of spicy or if you're cooking for somebody who can't handle spice, that's perfectly fine. There's literally anything that you can put in there and it'll probably taste really good. I've put in chopped vegetables like uh, broccoli or peas or corn or all of the above. Green beans work really well. Um, instead of using the bacon or pancetta breadcrumbs, you can cook bacon like you would for breakfast and then chop it up real fine and mix it in to the sauce which gives it a really nice taste. You can use uh, uh, cooked chicken, you could use sautéed steak, you could use, I mean, <laughs> think if you could think about it, if you could fit it in a bowl, it'll probably go well. Give it a try, and um, I think you'll find out that homemade macaroni and cheese is a hell of a lot better than what comes out of the box. All right. Thanks for watching, sorry if I ran a little long, and uh, I'll see you later. Happy cooking.